Hello noble home dogs. In today's video, we're going to be sort of comparing and contrasting Activision Spider-Man with Insomniac Games as Spider-Man for how they handled generational console shifts. <laughs> Spider-Man Miles Morales is here, the sequel to Marvel Spider-Man PS4 and a launch title for Sony's PlayStation 5. Now, whenever a new console generation rolls around, I'm one of those people that is always filled with dread. Filled with the kind of dread that my games console is about to go obsolete, and that I'm going to need to break the bank in order to play the latest releases. Now, the thing is, current gen hardware doesn't go obsolete the second next gen hardware comes around. But it is safe to say that growing up, my favorite character was always Spider-Man, and the way this character has been handled in the past, going from gaming generation to gaming generation, has left me with something of kind of a PTSD-like kind of feeling. So, let's wind the clocks back to when Activision held the gaming rights for Spider-Man. As far as superhero video games went, it was a very different world back then. You would get superhero video games as part of a movie or TV show tie-in. They weren't really treated as their own main event standalone stories. Spider-Man was one of the first superheroes to successfully make their own standalone video games with Spider-Man 2000 and Ultimate Spider-Man. So we're kind of seeing the beginnings of this, but it wasn't really until Batman Arkham Asylum in 2009 that we would see the superhero superhero video game boom as we know it today. Spider-Man video games were always great. You could always kind of bank on having an exciting experience and they just kind of got better and better going from Spider-Man 2000 all the way to Spider-Man 2 the movie game on the PlayStation 2. A game that really pushed the boundaries of what the PlayStation 2 could achieve. So when it came to the sequel Spider-Man 3 the game, a new era of video gaming was being ushered in by this game. Spider-Man 3 would be the first Spider-Man video game available on the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360. But as I've said earlier, new console generations don't immediately render old console generations obsolete, right? And being just a stupid little kid, I couldn't afford my own PlayStation 3 or Xbox 360, and my parents at the time had no inclination to buy me one. I mean, I hadn't asked for one, they were still making games on the PS2 after all. And as long as I would get to play Spider-Man 3 the game, I was happy. But when it came to Spider-Man 3 the game, there was a very big difference between the console generation's versions of this game. Spider-Man 3 the game on Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 was the main event version of this game. And while it needed much to be desired, it's safe to say I was very disappointed in the PlayStation 2 version at the time because it was not the game that was advertised by any stretch. Marketing of this game very much seemed to gloss over the existence of a PlayStation 2 version of this game. So I was very much just expecting a downscaled version of what we saw in the trailers on the new next-gen consoles, but what we got was a completely different game altogether. Something much smaller, something much more simplified. Kingpin and Scorpion were pretty prevalent in the trailers for Spider-Man 3 the game, but they were nowhere to be found in the PlayStation 2 version, among other features. And I was pretty disappointed at the time, as there's really no reason why the PlayStation 2 couldn't just handle a downscaled version of the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 version of the game. It wasn't just that there was cut content, the entire thing was completely different. Spider-Man's gameplay engine and web swinging were completely different, and a massive downgrade from Spider-Man 2 the game. But none of that versatility that was shown in the trailers for the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 version of the game was even remotely available to the PlayStation 2 version of the game. So for PlayStation 2, Two players, it was kind of just like, here's your game, now fuck off. With an incredibly bare bones version of the game that would release on next gen consoles. Now, little did I know at the time that actually Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 players were experiencing just as much disappointment, but from a very different place, because the next gen version of the game, I would even say, is actually a little bit worse. Yeah, you can do a bit more in it, but fuck me. Fuck me, what a circus. The combat is worse, it's definitely worse, and the boss fights go on so long that I just lose all interest altogether. Fuck that game. It doesn't even look very good, even for the time, it does not look good at all. But the point is, I was just extremely taken aback that we got such a simplified, downscaled version of Spider-Man 3 the game on the PlayStation 2, as opposed to just downscaling the actual 
big version of the game. But it does seem like post-Spider-Man 3 was almost kind of a time of Spider-Man apologia. Activision had another Spider-Man original on the way with Spider-Man Web of Shadows, and I was eager to play it. The game looked really exciting and really appealed to my younger, more edgelordy self, I guess. A shit giant Venom? Yeah, sure, okay, sign me the fuck up. You can be Spider-Man, but evil. Yeah, nah, 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 nah. Yeah, absolutely, I like that. That was what I was thinking. That was what I was thinking. So my kind of thought process, I mean, I was a dumb little kid, was Spider-Man 3, the game on PlayStation 2, was a blip, was just an anomaly. Even then, I enjoyed the game enough as a kid. I'm sure Spider-Man Web of Shadows on the PS2 is going to be great. I've been looking forward to this for a while, so I'm going to get that game. Now, I know that there was quite a world of difference between Spider-Man 3, the game on PS2, and Spider-Man 3, the game on that, that time current gen hardware, but what the fuck is this? Are you having a fucking laugh? It was one thing for Activision to think that the PlayStation 2 couldn't just handle a downscaled version of Spider-Man 3 the game, but now they don't even think it can handle a 3D immersive experience? Now I discovered this not through playing the game, but through just looking up Spider-Man Web of Shadows PS2 and seeing a YouTube video on it. I don't know what I was expecting at the time looking back, but this wasn't it. Now what's even more crazy is that when Spider-Man 3 the game came out, it shared its version with the Wii version. The Wii also got the very basic version of Spider-Man 3, the game that the PlayStation 2 did, which I suppose makes some sense because the Wii was all about the motion controls and they wanted to find a way to build motion controls into Spider-Man 3, the game, so it makes sense to have a more simple version of it in order to accommodate for that. But when it came to Spider-Man Web of Shadows on the Wii, it was just the main game but downscaled, which is what I expected for the PlayStation 2, but no, we, we, it shares its version with the PSP instead. Now I'm guessing this is because, in Activision's eyes anyway, the Wii was still somewhat relevant while the PlayStation 2 was clearly not. But it's like, Jesus Christ, way to insult the hardware. There was pretty much no warning that this would be the case. Okay, it's called Spider-Man Web of Shadows Amazing Allies Edition, as opposed to just Spider-Man Web of Shadows. But this was just straight up a scam. You omit the PlayStation 2 from advertising altogether, sneak it out there, and it's just the PSP version upscaled. Which is just a 2D fucking side-scroller. Are you having a fucking laugh? And that was the end of Spider-Man games for the PlayStation 2. That was the final one. What a way to fucking bow out. So, very much Activision's attitude toward PlayStation 2 users during the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 era was a big hearty, fuck you, you can't possibly handle what we've got in store for you. But this wasn't the only generational shift that they would see, as Activision still held the gaming rights to Spider-Man when the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One era of Spider-Man games came around. And their first game to get the Xbox One and PlayStation 4 treatment would be The Amazing Spider-Man 2 which also happened to be Activision's final Spider-Man game. The game would also release on PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360, so let's see how they treated the previous generation in that one. Well, the game looked like absolute shit, but the game also looked like absolute shit on the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. It was the exact same game with zero kind of upscaling, and I'm assuming that is simply because the game was developed for PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360, and moving it over to the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One was simply an afterthought. So there you go. If you didn't already, you now know what Activision's attitude towards Spider-Man on different consoles was. I mean, there's also just weird shit that's impossible to fathom like Spider-Man 2 on the PC, but that's, that's for another day. So, now let's compare that to Insomniac Games' attitude towards Spider-Man. Spider-Man on different gaming platforms. Spider-Man Mars Morales, very much a flagship game of the PlayStation 5, showcases a huge deal of what the PlayStation 5 has to offer. For starters, it comes with two graphical modes, Fidelity Mode and Performance Mode. Fidelity Mode makes the game look as visually beautiful and stunning as possible, complete with all of the PlayStation 5's ray tracing goodness. I don't really know what ray tracing is, but um... It apparently makes the game look better. And until I experience that for myself, that's what I'm just going to roll with here. In fidelity mode, the game runs at 30 frames per second, and it just looks absolutely gorgeous. With performance mode, you downgrade the visuals a little bit, but it now runs at a silky smooth 60 frames per second, which is great for gaming as it can feel that little bit more immersive. And I'd imagine that web swinging in 60 frames per second is pretty fecking gorgeous. Not to mention, from what I've heard anyway, the game allegedly utilizes a lot of the DualSense controller's capabilities. The PlayStation 5's DualSense controller has like kind of a haptic feedback kind of thing going on. I'm no scientist, I don't 
really know 100% what that means, but apparently like when your web tether kind of reaches its fullest sort of slack, I guess, you can kind of feel it in the triggers. They kind of have these sort of sensations in the remote that kind of they go more than just vibration, you know? The PlayStation 5 remote will actually kind of respond to the game, and that sounds kind of interesting. Not to mention, Spider-Man Mars Morales on the PlayStation 5 has minimal load times, like, so quick. Like, the fast travel, so, so quick. Again, I'm only going by what other people have said, because I have not played the game for myself. But Spider-Man Mars Morales is more than just a salesman for the PlayStation 5. Spider-Man Mars Morales is also available on the PlayStation 4. So, let's see what us PlayStation 4 players are getting. The exact same game, just omitting any of the PlayStation 5's capabilities, such as the immediate load times, the DualSense 4 controller capabilities, and the two optional graphical modes, with the game having one stock mode, which is going to be very reminiscent of Spider-Man PS4, which is already a fantastic looking game. So it's literally just Spider-Man Miles Morales, but as good as it's going to get on the PlayStation 4. And not only that, if you buy the PlayStation 4 version, you can upgrade it to the PlayStation 5 version at no extra cost, which is incredibly generous and unheard of. Now there are other perks to buying the PlayStation 5 version of the game, you can get the Ultimate Edition which features Spider-Man Remastered, a version of the Spider-Man PS4 game that runs with the two graphical modes of Spider-Man Miles Morales. It's more than just an upscaling of the original Spider-Man PS4, as there are now brand new graphical assets. But as well as that, there are three brand new suits to the game. The thing I will criticize slightly is I don't think Insomniac were very clear regarding the three suits. A lot of people genuinely believe that these would be exclusive to the Remastered Edition, and that that was reason enough to buy the Remastered Edition, which to be fair is only 20 extra bucks. So you're getting a really good deal there because Spider-Man PS4 as it is retails for more than that currently. But the thing is a lot of people went rushing out to buy the remastered version thinking they'd be getting three extra suits when those three extra suits are also coming to the PS4 version of the game as well, rendering not really much exclusivity to the remastered edition. The real exclusivity being just the visual upgrades, which to be fair are not going to be that much considering the time frame. A late era PlayStation 4 game and an early era PlayStation 5 game are not going to look like night and day by comparison. There's definitely going to be improvements, some pretty big ones, but they're not going to be like a whoa, this, this changes everything kind of comparison. And I think as console generations go on, we're going to be seeing less of that because let's face it, graphics are pretty fantastic these days. There is going to come a point where it's kind of as good as it can get and the PlayStation 5 has definitely implemented more kind of immersive features than just visuals and presentational ones, such as the DualSense controllers capabilities. So while there has been some uneven communication regarding Spider-Man Miles Morales on the PlayStation 5, it has to be said, Insomniac Games' attitude towards the changing generations has been night and day with Activision's. Activision would very much give it their all for one version of the game, and for everybody else it was a massive fuck you, you can't possibly handle this, as really emphasized in Spider-Man Web of Shadows' broader release. Whereas Insomniac Games have taken an incredibly inclusive stance, so that those who can't afford or can't justify the PlayStation 5 just yet can still get the full Spidey experience on their current console. One could argue that it's too inclusive to the point where there's really not that much point in getting a PlayStation 5, but let's be real, if you're getting a PlayStation 5, you're going to be getting it for more than just Spider-Man Miles Morales. There is a lot to look forward to in the next generation of gaming. But I really appreciate that this time it feels like we're being a bit more eased into it as opposed to just being laughed at until we get one. So that's the kind of comparison of Insomniac Spider-Man versus Activision Spider-Man regarding generational shifts. What do you guys think? Comment below and discuss, and as always if you enjoyed this video and you want to see more like it, hit subscribe, hit the like button, and in the description below are different links to different social media feeds where you can come and chat with me, as well as links to the Patreon and a join button for if you're feeling extra supportive and extra generous, but of course you don't have to do that, I would never expect that of you, it is a big ask. So with that out of the way, thank you so much for watching guys, and have a great day.